Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1978 classic film, Dawn of the Dead. Yes, George A. Romero's Dawn of the Dead. This is actually the first time I've seen this film. I know some people seeing this now are just going to be like in disbelief. Just like, how is this the first time? Um, it's I have so many movies on my list that I needed to get to. I finally got to this because this one was also hard to find. So big shout out to Rich Smith, my good friend who hooked me up with the Blu-ray for Dawn of the Dead. So that is where I watch it. This is the Anchor Bay release. I know there are a lot of different versions of the film. So this one was a bit over two hours. And I do have to say that for being over two hours, it sure doesn't feel like it's over two hours. Main reason being because it's a fun-ass movie. It is a super fun movie. It's a very endearing and engaging and fun movie too, which seems weird to say considering that it's, you know, not nice material. You know, it's supposed to be horror. It's supposed to be bleak. You know, things aren't happy in this film. Uh, you get some happy parts, but, you know. So anyway, this might be one of my longer reviews because I have a good amount to say, and it's a long film. Written and directed by George A. Romero. As we all know, I'm not going to go into everything he's done. We all know that. But one of the cool things I want to hit up front is that I like his writing because, especially with the Of the Living Dead films that he's done, you know, Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead, which I am going to do a review on as well, um, because at watching this film made me want to watch Day of the Dead. He... He moves the story along with the zombies themselves. You know, in the first one, they're just there to gut munch. They're just, where did they come from? They're just there to kill. In the second one, Dawn of the Dead, this one, there's a little more humanity to them because they're gravitating towards this mall. I know it's this big, you know, talk, um, thing about consumerism, which I'll talk about later, and I'm sure people have heard about ad nauseum with this film, but that's a little bit more of a human element to it, that, like, there's still something human about their brain that they remember that they're consumers, that they want to go to a mall, they want to consume products. And then in Day of the Dead, which I'll eventually do a review on, that's the one where they have a zombie who they try to kind of humanize in a way, and that does work. He actually starts to feel, like, some human-type emotions. So I just love the fact that Romero doesn't just show more zombies. It's just more zombies, more zombies, more zombies. He's moving the narrative forward. He's changing things. He's evolving the zombies. He's getting deeper into what they actually are and what they can be. And, and that's what I love. So, great writer. So, oh, and it's worth noting that Shudder is going to end up getting his, like, lost film, The Amusement Park. So, I'm interested to see that. Tom Savini uh, actually, you know, he did the practical effects for this film. He actually regrets having used the gray paint that he did did uh they went with that because night of the living dead was in black and white so they wanted to kind of match that so they decided to just go gray with the zombies and he regrets doing that though because it obviously ended up looking blue on film uh, but you know it's nobody's going to complain about that now it was from so long ago so many people just love this film anyway so it's it's water under the bridge but savini regrets that um, also, I'm going to give you a little bit of information. There is an unreal amount of information on, like, the behind-the-scenes stuff and stories having to do with the making of this film, uh, including documentaries. So, just go look for it. If you want, like, an insane amount of information, just go hit the internet. You know, IMDb trivia, Wikipedia, all that type of stuff. Um, I'm going to give you just a few things that I found particularly interesting. Um, so, Dario Argento was, uh integral in the making of this film. I think he was a producer on it. But one of the other things is that Argento had Romero come stay with him. Like, he hosted him in Italy so that he could have him secluded for the creation of the Dawn of the Dead script. Argento loved Night of the Living Dead so much that he really wanted the follow-up film, Dawn of the Dead, to be something special as well. And that's why he was just like, Romero, you know, come here, you can stay here, be secluded, no distractions, write a masterpiece. And I really think he, he wrote a pretty masterpiece of a, of a follow-up for Night of the Living Dead. And I know a lot of people would uh, agree with that. Oh, by the way, it took him three weeks to write that script. That's pretty fast, in my opinion. All filming was done between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. at the Monroeville Mall, which I have visited, and they do have a bust there of George A. Romero. They also have some areas where they have photos from the filming, uh, from the set of the film, which is really cool. 
Um, shooting was, uh, so at, just so you know, between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. is when they had to shoot because that's when the mall was closed, basically. That's when they were able to, you know, set everything up, not have people around, obviously. The shooting actually ended up being suspended around Christmas time, though, because there were so many Christmas decorations up. In order to shoot during that time, they would have to take them all down, do all their shooting, and then put them all back up before the mall opened. So they were just like, let's just take a hiatus on this. That's going to be way too much work. We won't get all that much done for the money we'd be spending for it. Romero made the film intentionally comedic because he wanted it to have a comic book style. Now, obviously, that scene and his proclivity for comic book type stuff is seen most in the Creepshow film, the first Creepshow film where he really wanted to pay homage to the EC comics. It's no surprise to anyone that he was a big fan of that, so it ended up in his filmmaking, and he cited that as an inspiration for the comedic aspects of Dawn of the Dead, which work really well, in my opinion. Romero did not give direction to the zombie extras, by the way. The reason he said is because if he gives direction to all these zombie zombie extras, of which they were an, there were an insane amount, that they would all act that one way. And that's not how it would really be with zombies. You don't want to see just all the zombies acting one way at the same time. They would do their own things. Like, they have their own kind of, you know, mannerisms and motivations and minds and, you know, depleted as they are. So I, th I found that interesting because that makes a lot of sense that he wouldn't, you know, be like, this is how you all have to do it. Um, so getting into the events of the actual film, I think the chaos that they start with at the TV station as they're trying to broadcast about the zombie apocalypse that's going on is a really good setup because it first of all starts with this air of just craziness and chaos, like I was saying. And of all places for it to be at the TV station where people who are watching it are seeing some of the crazy stuff going on there, hearing people like yelling, um, walking out, you know, it, there's a range of responses to it. Some people are trying to still do their job, be very serious about it, take it seriously. Some people are like, I'm out of here. I'm looking out for me. Some people are just in disbelief. It's a range of things going on and it's nuts. And People look at, especially like newscasters, as the people who are always professional and always just going to take news of disaster and um, deliver it in a very professional, calm manner. So for it to have been as chaotic as it is really shows you how crazy things are. Um, so I really like that intro. And by the way, George A. Romero himself is in it in the beginning. He's like working one of the boards at the, uh, at the TV station. The siege on the apartment complex immediately is insanely intense. That was a really crazy moment. And you could also see, you know, people reacting in different ways at that point. You know, you have that one police officer who just goes off the rails and just starts killing people. I guess it's more like kind of like a SWAT team type thing. He just starts killing anyone. You know, he's not just going after zombies at that point. So, yeah, you see the range of people. People who are trying to do good. People who are doing bad. Just it's all over the place. And it's chaos. Once again, chaos. I like the range of human responses. Oh, yeah, I already talked about that. Sorry. Notice there's the, like a distorted audio. When Peter, Ken Forey's character Peter, finds that grouping of all the zombies in the basement of the apartment complex, the audio changes. And it kind of sounds like a little bit echoey, a little bit kind of like disconnected and like other realm type sound, which I think was supposed to be this moment of like showing his inner feelings, Peter's inner feelings of this kind of surreal moment of like shock and terror and knowing that he just has to shoot all these zombies that obviously are people at the same time. So I thought that was a cool kind of auditory cue about what was going on with Peter's emotions and his feeling and his uh, thoughts at that point. Showing the hunting groups, basically having a ball killing zombies is pretty disgusting um, it shows kind of humans finding a way to like have fun with a terrible situation, which is why it's kind of like a sick situation. I mean, when you're watching the film, it's it's fine. You know, it, you, you're not disturbed by it or anything. But when you think about what's going on there, it's like this is a zombie epidemic. People are just being killed and eaten. And here there, there are these people just like drinking, having fun, listening to music and shooting these zombies like it's sport. Uh, you see that in the end, towards the end of the film, also in the attitudes of the bikers who end up busting into the mall. 
they're the exact same way. Like, they've been dealing with fighting the zombies so long that it's just become fun to them. And, you know, maybe part of that is a survival thing, that for their own brains, they need to turn it into something engaging and fun uh, in order to just cope, honestly, because that will happen. The heli helicopter head chop scene of that one zombie, iconic, everyone knows it's iconic, really cool looking, that was a great idea. The idea to turn everything on in the mall once Peter and Steven and Francine and Roger get there uh, to kind of, their, their idea to turn everything on in the mall, including the music and the fountains and everything, in order to deaden any of the, the sound that they be, may be making when they're going around the mall was very, very smart. I love that. And that's one of the things, like, there's a lot of detail that goes into the plans that these people have, which speaks to the writing of Romero when he was thinking out the story. Uh, it's a nice comedic moment when the music comes on and you just end up seeing zombies kind of like shuffling around, falling about, and it's like a fun music too. So that's that kind of like comedic aspect to it. That also happens later in the film too when there are scenes where they're, you know, fighting zombies. It adds that element of fun to, uh, and, and comedy to the film. Even Peter and Roger succumb to consumerism as they run around the department store taking things and they're joyful about it when they first get into the department store. Then there's the montage that comes in actually much later as well, where everyone's starting to grab stuff. That's when when all four of them are starting to, you know, create their new life there at the mall because they've finally gotten all the zombies out and secured the mall, basically. So that's at that point they're feeling like, oh, you know, maybe we can put something together that's very normal, a normal life, and we can live here, and they're going around, like, joyfully grabbing all this food and clothing and, you know, what have you. Um, I like that montage, by the way. It's very well done. It initially seems like there are a sparse amount of zombies, but then the numbers kind of steadily grow until they finally take care of the issue and secure things like I was talking about. A lot of interest ends up being driven by wondering where they'll go within the mall and how they'll end up choosing to deal with each individual zombie situation. Uh, it gives it this really interesting kind of adventurous feeling to it. You truly never know where the script's going to end up going, and you don't know where these characters are going to end up in the end. And the fact that you lose Roger, that you lose Steven, a.k.a. Flyboy, um, it, it, it hits home because you didn't see it coming. Like, you have a an inkling that someone's probably not going to make it, or maybe that none of them are going to make it. But you end up spending so much time with the characters, and you see the relationships that are forged amongst those characters that you feel it like I felt it I felt you know a bit of emotion when Roger um died well actually mainly mainly when he get, gets bitten I didn't really care that much when he was bitten because his character wasn't that sympathetic at that point but they did a really good job of after he's bitten or Romero did after he's bitten making you see him as more of a nice person as more of like a relatable character and then when um, Peter eventually has to shoot him, it gives it so much more impact. And then obviously the scene in the elevator when Steven, Flyboy, uh, gets bitten and you just know it's not going to be good. And then he comes back as a zombie and there's still that kind of human part of him that goes back to the little home that they created, he, Peter, and Francine, um, like he's returning home from his normal day, and then that's when Peter has to shoot him. So there's a lot of gravity in that one, too, because at that point, you love Peter as a character, and you love the love between Stephen and Francine, and the friendship between Stephen and Peter. It's, it's emotionally very well developed, in my opinion. Uh, you might not think with the concept going into it, but yeah. When Stephen's trying to console Francine in the very beginning... Uh, the look on her face shows that she's thinking further than just kind of living at the mall for whenever. Uh, she's thinking past, you know, what do we do with our lives? How do we secure things? And part of the reason being that she was pregnant at that point. But I also love her response of basically, you're going to treat me like everyone else here. You know, she steps up and she's like, you're not going to take care of me, basically. You're going to teach me to do everything that you guys are going to be doing here. I'm going to contribute. You're not going to hide things from me. This is all four of us in this together equally. I love that aspect of it because with a lot of films, especially older films, the women were just characters to be protected, characters to get in harm's way and not do a whole lot about it. So the fact that she was like a good, strong character, but also being, you know, sensitive and relatable, it was nice. 
You have to respect... Oh, I literally just talked about it. My apologies. Roger is annoying. It, at first, I didn't like Roger at all. He seemed like an ass. He was running around, like, hooping and hollering a lot, which was, like, super annoying, especially when they were out running around getting those uh, trucks to bring them to the mall. But, like I said, after he's bitten is when he starts to endear himself to people. He's, you know, more subdued. Uh, I think he becomes a better person kind of because he's trying to experience the last portions of his life because he knows his time is running out. I mean, they all do, basically. There's an odd satisfaction in watching the trucks plow the zombies over. Can we all agree on that? I don't know. There's just something about watching those scenes where they're driving the trucks into the zombies. There's something satisfying about seeing that. The moment you see Roger get bit, you know it's going to be bad. Uh, it's then up to the others to properly deal with the situation. And that that is just, that situation that's coming, that everyone knows is coming, the viewers, the characters, it just hangs over everything until the moment when Peter does have to shoot Roger. And by the way, when that happens in the film, note that uh, Stephen and Francine are watching TV, watching the news, where the doctor on there is basically saying that people need to be making the logical choices in this situation with the zombies. And that's when Peter shoots Roger in the head. And that is the logical choice at that point. You know, it's emotional. It's tough to do because, yes, that was his friend. But that's the logical thing to do. He's a zombie at that point. You got to shoot him in the brain and be done with it. So I like that kind of mirroring of what was going on. You know the film is about to hit the next level when Peter and Steven are stocking up on guns and ammo. That is a fun montage as well. Romero did a great job with like the montage type stuff in this. Just real fun. Uh, the use of the car in the mall. Another moment of a lot of fun. He put so many like fun moments into the film, which I think is part of the reason that I found it so charismatic and such a charming film. I, I just found it so charming. I just I want to watch it again. The way they draw out Roger's decline does help with getting the situation and the sympathy to sink in for the audience. So that goes back to kind of what I was talking about, but this, it was good that they took time with it. When the doctor on TV... Oh, I literally just went over that a little bit ago. My apologies. Just when life was looking good, other people show up to mess it all up. It figures the people are awful. That is something that uh, I believe Romero started with his films, especially in Night of the Living Dead. He got it out there in the very beginning. I know most people associate the within zombie films the element of the people being the worst of it. I know they associate The Walking Dead with that, but Dawn of the Dead. Dawn of the Dead clearly pointed that out. It was definitely pointed out in Night of the Living Dead with the hunting party at the end who killed Doug Jones's character, but... It's very clearly shown in Dawn of the Dead once the bikers finally show up. Because why are they coming? Because they want what Francine and Stephen, at that point it's just Francine, Stephen, and Peter. They want what they have. They want the life that they've secured. They want the resources that they have. And that's one of the things, is that humans will always mess it up for themselves. Because people will always fight over things. They will always fight over ideologies or resources. The bigger thing being resources, actually. There will always be conflict. And when you have something like a zombie invasion or a zombie epidemic, you can get that under control. But once, to a degree, it's under control, which is what's going on there. You know, Francine, Stephen, and Peter have gotten their situation under control. The bikers obviously have gotten their situation under control because they know how to deal with them to fight them. I mean, at that point, they're having fun killing them. Then they start thinking about, now what? And the bikers obviously wanted more. They needed more. They needed more resources. They see them all. They're saying, ah, great place for shelter. Great place to get resources, to get whatever we're looking for. Food, clothes, whatever. And then that becomes, oh, you don't want to share with me necessarily? I'm just going to take it by force. The bikers hitting the zombies with pies and seltzer I think is really funny, uh, but it also does show that element that they're not really taking the situation seriously anymore, and that kind of goes back to what I was talking about before, where maybe mentally they just need that. They have to get in that mode to cope. Otherwise, if you're just you know taking everything super seriously all the time, you're just going to be super depressed about it. So I like that sequence, though. 
The mall went from serene to chaos super fast in this. It's like the establishment of any civilization. Those who organize it hit a good calm period, but it never lasts because people will always fight each other for whatever reasons, like I was talking about. Consumerism drives the zombies to the mall, but it also ends up driving the bikers to the mall. There's no difference. Humans are will always fight over resources. Yeah, that's one of the big things. This film's usually talked about in the context of the zombies come to the mall because they're so uh, they're so indoctrinated when they were alive humans with marketing and advertising and saying you need these products and you need these products be a good consumer and that's legitimate that is there that is definitely there like when they say it's basically all they know it's all that's left of their human brain is how conditioned they are to go to the mall to get products but the bikers are the same way you know the bikers show up there i help roger peter francine and steven are the same way they go there for the same reason you're conditioned to go after the resources that's what you do and when it's Initially, it's resources you need, but then after that, it, you get comfortable, and then it becomes resources you want. And I think that's the biggest degree of what they're showing with the bikers, because it seems like the bikers are doing okay. It's just they see the mall, and they're like, "I we want. So just a, just a point about making the zombies and the, the non-zombie humans about the same. They are about the same in this. It's a tough moment when Peter has to shoot Steven, especially as soon as he walks in the door because, like I was saying, you see that humanity in him. It's just like he's coming home from work at the end of the day to his wife and his friend. I know they didn't get married, but, you know, they set up a life like that. It's, it's an impactful moment. It's a great moment when Peter decides he should actually take a chance to stay alive and see where things go. You know, he had that moment where he had that really small pistol and he had it to his head and he was thinking about just ending it, staying behind, um, taking out a few zombies and then, you know, Francine could helicopter away. But it's this cool, triumphant, like uplifting moment when he finally, he just takes it away and he shoots a zombie with the gun instead and then he gets out of there. And, you know, Francine and he end up taking off and it's a hopeful, good moment but you also think further than that as an audience member, and you're kind of like, what now, though? Especially when the line comes up about asking how much gas they have in the helicopter, and Francis says, not much. So how far are they even going to be able to get at that point is, is the question that starts swirling in the minds of the audience. Um, it obviously sets it up for another film, but it also just makes you realize how long can people in this situation just keep running? You know, uh, they were they were fine at the mall. They had a great spot at the mall, but other humans came and screwed that up for them, so they had to flee. What's next? You know, are they going to find another place where they can hole up like that for a long time? For how long? How long until other humans show up? How long until, you know, they slip up on, on uh, being cautious and a zombie gets through and they get killed? These are all the questions that end up popping in your head because of the way this film's constructed. Um, everyone knows of the heavy satire of consumerism. It makes sense because companies bombard us from a young age uh, to be mindless buyers of products, just like zombies. When people become zombies, consumerism is so ingrained in us that we end up gravitating to the malls like they are a food source. If you notice in the first film, Night of the Living Dead, it's all about the... Uh, zombies being driven by needing to eat. Now that's still going on in Dawn of the Dead, but it moves past that and it actually becomes more of a focus on needing to be at the mall just because that's what's ingrained in them. So it's that moment that I was talking about, about the evolution of the zombie and showing that there is more humanity to them than people think. And obviously that happens even further in Day of the Dead. Having it take place in a mall does help audience members relate more, I think. As everyone has been to a mall at some point, at least back when this film came out, uh, it gets you thinking about what you personally would do in that situation because it's a place you're very familiar with going to. And let's be honest, everyone's had a this fantasy somewhat or dream or whatever about being trapped in a mall at night and, it, and you're all alone. And what do you do? So I feel like this film kind of taps into that in a way and gets you thinking as an audience member while you're watching it, 
you're, I mean, you're kind of living vicariously through the characters for that reason, but you're also thinking like, what would I be doing in this situation? Before, I would just think of it as this fantasy of like, if I was trapped in there, you know, would I go play at the arcade? Would I go just eat a bunch of junk food? Um, it then takes it further to what if I had to stay there and what would I do for survival? Yeah, it's a good place to be in that situation, but for how long and what would you do? And, you know, when does it get boring? I find myself enjoying the more mundane portions of the film, which is cool since that's what the characters actually enjoy most themselves. That's when things are the most calm. Uh, a reprieve from the, the uh, sorry, a reprieve from the zombie situation to feel somewhat normal again. So I like the fact that there is a good amount of kind of like downtime or the montages that are done of them, you know, playing video games or, you know, stocking up on clothing, food, all that type of stuff. Because some people may step back and be like, well, where's the zombies? Where's the fun? Um, and I get that. But it's showing the relaxation that these people need. It's showing how they need to live their lives, how they need that mental break from what's really going on, especially after they finally secured the mall for, uh, because of the zombies. So really good. Um, really enjoy this. Like I said, I just want to watch it again. Um, glad I own this now. Thank you, Rich Smith, when you see this. I'm sure you'll watch it. But out of five stars with half stars in play, what am I going to give Dawn of the Dead? Um, it's very rare for me to actually give five star ratings. But I'm, an, I'm not going there with this one. But I'm giving it a four and a half stars. I don't do quarters. So four and a half stars for Dawn, the original Dawn of the Dead. I have seen, <clears throat> excuse me, I have seen, and I think I own on DVD, the remake. Uh, I should rewatch that and then do a kind of a comparison with it. But I remember liking it. But now having seen the original, this is way better. This is way more interesting. It's Romero. You know, he's a, he was a great writer, and I'm very fortunate that I was able to meet him when he was alive. Very nice man, too. So, uh, great film. Glad I finally saw it. On to Day of the Dead. Go ahead, put comments down there. Let's talk about it. Uh, I'm sp specifically interested to know everyone's first experience with this film. You know, were you really young when you saw it? What were your thoughts? Were you scared? Um, did you just think it was fun? You know, whatever. Let, let's get nerdy. Do me a quick favor, though, hit that subscribe button if you like this video or any video I've ever done. That is your way to repay me, show me that you appreciate what I'm doing here because I'm just doing this to build a nerdy horror community here, honestly. I just want to talk nerdy horror stuff because where I live, I don't know people who will t get nerdy with me about horror like this. So I love when people comment and we can kind of go back and forth about, about these films, so... Uh, I would appreciate it if you would subscribe. Also, if you hit the notification bell, that way you'll end up knowing when I put up new review videos like this, the in-depth ones, ones that are less in-depth that are the spoiler-free, or haul videos, unboxing videos, all that type of stuff. But regardless, I really do thank you for taking your time to watch this. And until next time, keep it brutal.